and our special guest on the screen so that we can uh, get right into this interview. Good evening, uh, Dr. Robert. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Derek? I'm doing well. Thank you for joining us and let me officially welcome you to the Liberia Radio and Television Network. And uh, well, let's, we'll hope to have a, a good a conversation here today on this network. But again, welcome to the Liberia Radio and Television Network. Great to be with you. Hi, Dr. Thank you. And so let me just uh, run through uh, the itinerary for this interview. So we'll have it's, been, it was, it's a panel interview. So I have uh, Mr. Solomon Reeves. I have uh, Mr. Matthew Foley. And so I would now take the opportunity to uh, start with you guys to do a brief introduction of yourself. And then we will finish up with, uh, Mr., with Dr. Robert. Mr. Reeves. Good evening. Uh Dr. Roberts, Mr. Foley, Yali, uh, I'm glad to be on. Uh, my name is Solomon Reeves. Personally, I'm in New York City, precisely in Staten Island. I'm a Liberian, uh, Liberian American, uh, if you will. Uh, I'm also a partisan of the Republican Party, um, and I'm doing humanitarian work in Liberia, especially in rural reverses, the village right behind me there. So I'm glad to be on and for us to talk about matters concerning humanity. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Reeves. Let's come over to you now, Mr. Foley. Uh, welcome to the Liberia Radio and Television Network, first of all, and also uh, talk to us about yourself, Mr. Foley. All right, good evening. Uh, good evening, Dr. Roberts. It's great to have you on here this evening, uh, Matthew Foley. I'm also a Liberian. Um, I've studied here in the States and back in England. Uh, I study criminal justice and sociology at Iowa State, uh, global affairs at Penn State, international relations at uh, the University of Leeds in England. And uh, I'm currently completing a Juris Doctorate at Albany Law School. So uh, I do um, international relations. That's like my specialty in uh, international law, government law, and so forth. So I look forward to speaking with you tonight. Thank you for being here again. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Foley. And now let's join uh, Wendy Nemini from uh, the Freedom FM, and by way of announcement, this uh, uh, interview will be live streamed by Freedom FM in Liberia and also on their Facebook page. But let's go over to Wendell. Wendell, welcome to the Liberia Radio and Television Network, and just give us a brief introduction of yourself. Are you with us? Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Derek, and thanks to. Uh, thanks to the rest of the team uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, day. And uh, I'd like to say, well, I'm, I'm like you said, I'm, I'm Wendell Nimne, and I'm, I'm joining you guys. Derek, I don't know, I'm, I'm hearing myself. Yes, I'm hearing echo. Oh, no, too, Derek. So. Are, you, are you joining us with two devices or is it just one? Because I'm hearing echo. But anyway, uh, let me just continue. I, I'm, I'm Wendell Nimne from, from West Africa, Liberia, a Liberian journalist, and it's good sharing the platform with you, uh, Dr. Robert. I want to say thank you for taking up your time. Thank you so much, uh, Wendell and uh, Nimlin. So uh, let's come down to you, uh, Dr. Robert. Again, it is a pleasure to have you here on the Liberia Radio and Television Network. So I'll just give you the opportunity now to introduce yourself to uh, our audience. I mean, I have your website puller here about about you and you have a, an extensive pro a profile, but I would like to give you the opportunity now to introduce yourself to, to our audience. Well, I appreciate that. It's great to be with you uh, tonight, Derek, and all of the panelists. Uh, it's great to hear your backgrounds and 
your heart for Liberia. Uh, you know, my journey began in corporate America. Uh, I grew up in the U.S. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, one of the, the most important things growing up for us was value, uh, our work ethic, our integrity. And so the more uh, I went in business, uh, we had great success uh, in, in technology companies, database companies, uh, software, software as a service, technology, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence. Uh, but then things moved into government uh, in 2016 and started. I was a, an advisor with uh, on the U.S.-China trade war uh, and then also did some things uh, in Africa, numerous countries in Africa uh, on clean water and uh, education. Uh, we still have Roland College over there. In fact, in 20 last year, 2022, uh, we graduated 2,451 students in our Kingdom College of uh, School of Business and Entrepreneurship. Uh, it was the the largest uh, gathering of not a non political gathering in the in the uh, county history of Bahiga. So it, it was it's been great, really serving the people uh, in the continent of Africa in entrepreneurship and in education and in clean water. Uh, and then we've also, uh, in, since uh, 2021, I was uh, with a U.S. delegation to South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan is the world's newest country. And uh, so we've been trying to help them in the ways of peace and uh, a republic and how to govern in that way. And so it has been a, a pleasure and an honor to see the growth in that country as well. And then that uh, some of the things that I've seen in working with other countries, uh, it exposed a lot of the American corruption uh, behind the scenes, how we manipulated other governments, how we manipulated people. And uh, it got to where there was a moral crisis that I was faced with. I either could no longer in good faith represent the United States of America in that capacity, or I needed to do something about it. And that's one of the things God used to move me along towards uh, speaking to me and calling me to run for president of the United States, uh, which we announced January 20th of this year. Thank you, and, and thank you for uh, ending with that because I was going to get right into that after. Just recently, you announced your your intent to to run for the 2024 Republican candidate for the president of the United States. Before I ask you, let me just remind my panelists that we this is a panel discussion, so I will be coming to you guys for comments or questions to our special guest here. So, uh, Dr. Roberts, you know, what, what inspired, I know you said this very briefly though, but what inspired you at this time now to, to run for the Republican candidate for the elections in 2024? What is your inspiration? Uh, the inspiration, short and simple, is that God called me to do it. I knew that this is what he wanted me to do with my life at this time in human history. There's no other reason to do it. In fact, I used to say that you had to be crazy or corrupt to run for president, one of the two. Uh, but I have since learned that there's a third C, and that is if you're called. Uh, so I do believe that I was called. I know that I'm doing what I was supposed to do to stand and be the light and to show the world there is a better way. There's a different way. We don't have to have the animosity. We don't have to. We can have different ideas and we can debate those ideas. But that's not where politics is in the world today. And so I wanted to bring honor and decency back to humanity again in that sense. Thank you very much. Now, let me uh, come to you, Mr. Reeves. If you have any question or comment, now will be your time. Thank you very much. My question to you, uh, uh, Roberts, is that uh, both of us, we are Republican and we have something there they call Rano. Uh, the Rano and the other one. So, what is what is your what is your stand on some Republican being Rano and some Republican being just Republican? How can you uh, how can you bring everybody together uh, uh, regarding the way the party is? It's a great question, and you're right. It's very the party itself is very divided, and then add the Democrats and independents to it, and your the country almost seems that it is impossible to unite. And I can tell you that if unity alone was the goal, then the only way to uh, accomplish that is through compromise and through uh, watering things down to the point that they don't have the impact that we need on the world today. Uh, how I, I believe that unity and uniting the Republican Party and the United States at large is going to be a byproduct, not, not the end. It is a byproduct of what the correct goal should be. When unity is the goal, we'll make wrong decisions. We'll do wrong things. 
But when we make the standard to do right by each other, to do right by American citizens, uh, and then to do right by all people and nations on earth, then that is something that we can all unite behind, even though we'll have different opinions or, or different ideas on what the future of education can look like and the future of energy can look like and the future of, of economy and what do the jobs of the future look and what do what what kind of vehicles or if if any will we be driving in the future uh we're able to really expand our thought when we are unified but until we are of a, a single mind in that sense again where we at least have that common decency one to another i'm telling you progress will not be made Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Robert. Mr. Foley, would you uh, like to go at this time? <clears throat> oh, sure. Uh, Dr. Roberts, again, thank you for being here tonight. Um, you spoke of your interactions uh, across Africa, your work across the continent, and you also spoke of uh, U.S.-China relations. Currently, there are over five or six of your candidates uh, hoping to uh, represent the Republican Party in the 2024 presidential election. Given your uh, work in Africa and your understanding of US-China uh, relations, American uh, foreign policy plays a, a huge role on global affairs. How do you think you can impact U.S.-China relation while also positively impacting uh, U.S. relations across Africa, because we've seen that usually um, U.S. candidates or presidential candidates come in and make promises to the continent of Africa, but when they when they when they are elected, we usually see Africa taking the back seat in global affairs, even though Africa uh, is essential when it comes to international politics. So how, how do you think you can uh, impact uh, U.S. relation with Africa as a continent while also uh, working on U.S.-China relations? Well, I appreciate the question. Uh, there are several other candidates running. Uh, most of them don't even know uh, anything about Africa or have not been a part of Africa. Uh, that was where my heart and soul was. I actually thought that was going to be my work for the rest of my life is just in Africa. Uh, the work that we've done in Kenya and uh, we've been in Rwanda and, and uh, Ghana and uh, Malawi and, and Zambia, just different countries that we've really invested in. And I just thought that was going to be the rest of my life. And so we kind of we gave ourselves uh, because I believed also in the African people. I believe that the, uh, the continent is the last greatest economic frontier in the world. I believe that they have a very similar unity problem and that if the one point, you know, four to 1.9 billion people on the continent could come together uh, and overcome, override uh, some of the tribal uh, conflicts, that they would be one of the most powerful forces on earth. Uh, and so I, I wanted to see that. And so we invested in youth, we invested in education. Uh, in literacy and so forth, in clean water, just so that they'd have good health, so they could learn. Uh, and and so that's where we thought, and my wife and I even thought we would be serving for the rest of our lives. Uh, so there's a big difference between, oh, it's something for a campaign and something where we have spent, spent nearly every last dime we had helping people in Africa, uh, literally thinking we we're going to have another home in different parts of Africa and so forth, just because we were there so much. But here's what I can tell you when it comes to uh, the governments of the world. The next president of the United States must be proficient in artificial intelligence and must be proficient in foreign affairs and international diplomacy. The next presidency is going to be uh, defined by international relations. We have wars everywhere we look, the boundaries of countries are being redrawn every single day before our eyes. The amount of problems, the amount of wars simultaneously being fought, information wars, biological wars, uh, cyber wars, physical wars, water wars, uh, spiritual wars, 
you have to have a president that can fire on all of those cylinders. When you look at every single one of the other presidential candidates, they might be great at domestic policy. They might be great at one aspect of this. What none of them even come close to, they don't even have 20% of the qualifications the next president of the United States is going to need to have to keep the United States citizens safe and secure and prosperous, much less the rest of the world. I'm tired of, uh, of, of, of United States uh, abusing the power and the position that we have around the world. And so I will do right. Let me say this about China relations, U.S.-China relations. Uh, I had the, the privilege of speaking and addressing China's business leaders and government leaders in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, China, uh, about five years ago. And when I was there, uh, not something very few Americans have ever done. Uh, and so when I was addressing them, I was addressing intellectual property theft. I was in, uh, addressing the U.S.-China trade war and the gross uh, in, in, in difference in trade. And uh, and then I basically told them they don't have to copy us and to steal our intellectual property that got they're made in the image of God, just like we are. They've got brilliant minds and they can create. They don't have to copy and they can create products and services that contribute to humanity and better all of our lives on the planet. But here's what the government officials told me uh, at the end. Uh, they said, while we don't agree with you because they value deception as a business tactic. And in the United States, we believe that that is morally and ethically wrong to deceive people. Uh, but they believe it's a, a good business strategy. And they said, even though we disagree uh, with you on several of these points, uh, what constitutes intellectual property theft, etc., we at least appreciate your spirit. We really like the spirit you've said it. And so we honor you for this. And I really believe that in all international relations with every country on earth, we have to have the ability to communicate. We can speak truth. We can articulate clearly, but we can do it with the right spirit so that uh, it is it can be true relations with every country on earth. We have to have the ability. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Robert. And guys, if you have a follow up, just uh, interrupt me and let me know. And I'll give you the opportunity to do a follow up. Well, let me recognize the president of uh, Mistress Wilson. Mr. Wilson, if you have any question, uh, you have the opportunity to do so. You're on, you're muted, uh, Mistress Wilson. Thank you. I'm talking to myself. Thank you again once more, Dr. Roberts. Is you now your familiar face. So I'm very grateful that you are here. Um, I, I am aware of some of your work, and I know you know that. So I appreciate you. So we are very grateful you're here. But now you spoke of those other African nations, and Liberia is now your next adapter at home. I take you by force, you know. That's why. <laughs> so Liberia, Mama Liberia is your next adapter at home that you going to incorporate Mama Liberia with the rest of the other African nations. And um, there are things that you now becoming aware of with Liberia. Liberia was birthed by the United States of America. So yes. in doing so, we are America baby. So if you have your baby, you should be able to continue to nurture her. You shouldn't give her heart, you know, make her feel bad and pain and all those different things. So some of the damages that have been done to Liberia during the one government, we need to put an end to that. And putting an end to that, it will not take you alone. We are aware of that. We take collaboration from other, uh, uh, how you say, bipartisans and whatever to see how we, they all can come together to help Mama Liberia. I appreciate your work from other African nations, but I'm speaking from my heart and you know who I am. Mama Liberia is my, pain my pain and everything right now my country cannot no longer be denigrated by the great united states i came here as a teenager 1985 like america is my home though everything i know is in america but my place of birth will always be my passion when i took the oath to be a united states citizen i was told and i remind you on that 
that the uh, judge told me, no matter what you do, you have to return to your home. Don't forget your home. And that embedded in my head. Because of that, I remain passionate about my home. So I will appeal to you tonight and to the rest of U.S. Congress. We need to end this. Liberia can no longer bleed. We have a loud voice and we are speaking. So thank you once more. Thank, thank you very you. much, uh, Mrs. Wilson. Would you like to respond to that, Dr. Robert? You know, I would say on the bipartisan effort, uh, on the U.S. delegation to South Sudan, it was completely bipartisan. It was five uh, Republicans, five Democrats, uh, six U.S. Congress people, three U.S. ambassadors and me, and, uh, generally speaking. And I can tell you that uh, it, every country we went to, it looked nothing like how they to interact in the United States. It, they were unified. Uh, the problem was that we would talk about and sit around in the evening uh, talking about what needs to be done in these different countries. Uh, but then when we get in front of the State Department or when we get back into some formal setting, all of a sudden, all of the things that we had said went out the door and everyone reverted to the, well, thank you for all the great work you're doing. And there was never any change. So we would say one thing to the country, the host country, but then when we're with the State Department, the people who can affect change uh, and really drive a lot of the policy in these various countries, uh, all of a sudden the mouths were closed. In fact, they did the opposite. And so that was part of the problem that I saw, the injustice, that it was completely opposite. Well, nothing's ever going to change if that is how we're moving forward. Uh, so I can tell you that everything that we're doing, everything that I will do as president is everything that I've been doing. It's not something new that we have to start. It is not a new behavior for me. It is a continuation of what we've been doing for years. And I believe that we can make a change. I believe that it, it, it starts with us. You know, I can't go back and fix all of the grievances that have happened in the world. But the reason why uh, I was so moved by what's happening in Liberia right now, I was just in Chile, South America, several weeks ago dealing with another grave injustice that the United States committed against someone 30 years ago, Carlos Cardoan. He still has an uh, Interpol red notice, the world's most wanted man on him. He's been a prisoner in his own home only for doing our bidding. And then we burned him. And this is happening over and over and over uh, around the world. And so I'm evaluating all the different in, uh, grievances, but I can't go back and change that. What I can do as president and as a human is, is uh, to state that America needs God, first of all, and that an America without God will fail. And that with a Roland Roberts for president, I will do right by our people, just like I expect every president of every nation to do right by their own people and nation. And then I will do right by all people in all nations on earth. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Robert. Uh, before we move on to the next subject, or uh, actually before we take a break, uh, you you took a very strong position on the recent sanctionings of high-ranking officials in the Liberia government, for example, Finance Minister Sam, Samuel Twell. Before we have that discussion, I would like for us to take a brief break. When we come back, we will get right into that uh, discussion. Again, guys, if you're watching us on Facebook, this is the Liberia Region Television Network. Make sure you're following us and also make sure you're sharing this program so that your friends and family will be able to benefit with this special interview with Dr. Roland Robert. Again, let's take a very brief break. Freedom Radio, 87.9 FM. Welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you're watching us from. This is the Liberia Radio and Television Network, your local media institution, 
right here in Northeast Philadelphia. My name is Derek Yale, and I'm playing host tonight in a special interview with uh, Dr. Rollins Robert, who will be contesting for the Republican or candidate for the elect the president's the presidential elections next year. And I'm here with a team of panelists for this uh, special interview. So let's get right into our next conversation on your position on the recent sanctionings of high-ranking officials, high-ranking government officials in Liberia. And for this, I would like to begin with you, Mr. Foley. And uh, you can start off up with any questions and comment on uh, the sanctioning in Liberia, Mr. Foley. Thank you, Mr. Yali. Uh, Dr. Roberts, so uh, the Global Meniski Act, under which uh, in the past, say, year and a half or two, seven prominent Liberian government officials have been sanctioned. That act began uh, back in 2012. Back to, into the history, we saw that in 2008, this Russian uh, tax lawyer and an auditor called Sergei Manesky, he was arrested and a year later he died in prison in russia and so the united states congress passed this act in 2012 to target russian officials or individuals within russia that were responsible for mr maniski's death and in 2016 uh, congress globalized the act to give the U.S. president the authority to target uh, individuals across the globe who are involved with gross human rights violations and corruption. So uh, since 2016, uh, in 2017, President Trump uh, enacted Executive Order 13818 to be able to target those individuals and that uh, executive order ever since its passage in December 2017, we've seen that over 600 individuals and entities have been sanctioned by the United States government under the Global Maniski Act, including those seven prominent Liberians. Uh, the question here is, firstly, what is your position on sanctioning under the Global Maniski Act? And secondly, uh, what do you think can be done to make this uh, act more effective? Because uh, do, doing the research on this act, what I see is that the individuals that are sanctioned under this act, their U.S.-based assets are seized. Uh, they, are, they are banned from coming to the United States. That is, their visas are revoked if they have U.S. visas. And to some extent or at some point, they are banned from in transacting with U.S.-based companies. Uh, what is usually not done, however, is most times some of these businesses or individuals, they still have large assets back home. And so they are still able to either transact freely or even live uh, good lives. We've seen that in Liberia, three government officials were sanctioned Back in 2022, those individuals, just in the recent elections, two of them were elected to the Liberian Senate, which means that, or which meant that, even though their U.S.-based assets were seized, even though their U.S. visas were revoked, they still have sufficient wealth to partake in the uh, legislative election in Liberia. So, how do you think uh, the act can be made more effective? So a lot of U.S. laws, especially when it comes to sanctions and foreign relations, are intentionally broad and intentionally vague. And they do that so that they can use it as a hammer, a flexible hammer in any situation that they need. What I'm starting, what I have been seeing over these past number of years is that a lot of times a law such as that starts with good intention. But like you said, they didn't see the power and they broaden those powers or make them permanent, and then they get abused. Okay, so it can, a lot of the things start off right, and this, I believe, did start off right, 
but I'm seeing it misapplied. In, in case in point is with Liberia. So in this situation, and I've seen it done in South Sudan as well, uh, where, and it's a specific application, and there's other applications that are perfectly appropriate, uh, but I'm seeing it more and more where the United States uses it as a weapon against uh, it, it, a commercially, a commercial weapon. So when the U.S., a U.S. company is uh, not awarded a contract that they believe they should be awarded, then government is stepping in and using their authority and hammer to force sitting governments uh, or officials are put, applying pressure uh, to make them do that. But here's the thing. What happened in Liberia it, it, with this situation, with, uh, the, with, with Finance Minister Twia uh, going with one company and favoring them, giving them the longer term and uh, verse over the uh, American company. That happens every day in the United States where they're favoring one company over another. So the only issue from a U.S. standpoint, I'm not getting into Liberian politics at all, whether which side people are on. I'm saying from a United States perspective, we abuse the sanctions when a commercial, what should have been a commercial transaction with another government, instead of just saying, okay, we did not get that contract and understand that that's how business goes. Oftentimes, uh, instead, we wanted to pout about it, use our weight and say, uh, because Liberia is a poorer country than the United States, and then to apply these sanctions unfairly on them. Uh, and, and, and here's the thing. I know some people are saying, well, they're corrupt and it's corrupt either way. That's not what I'm here to debate. What I'm saying is this act of U.S. sanctions on them for this circumstance was wrongly applied, I believe, unjust. Uh, and that's what I want to do as president of the United States is to make sure that I do right by people and nations of Earth. I believe it's a national security issue. I also believe it's an economic issue. Uh, I believe it's better, best for our co uh, companies, and I think it's best for African nations. African nation, every sovereign nation gets to choose for themselves. The best way to govern. I can tell you that if you, if I was the CEO of an American company again, I've been the CEO of several. If I became a CEO again of, of a U.S. company and they wanted to go invest in certain parts of Africa, I can tell you that based on the politics, or based on the instability of certain regions, I would not go invest there. I remember when one government wanted to give me land and they wanted to give me a building for Roland College and to transform Africa and and help us. But I did. I declined because I don't want anything given to us by the government. I'm hesitant enough to be to pay for it because oftentimes they'll come and say, well, someone else already owns that. And it's been sold 10 different times and it goes back to the original landowner. So there's there's some real complications and governments, excuse me, enterprises around the world must understand the 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 challenges to doing business in Africa. But it's worth it. It's and, and that's where my my policies uh, come into play on how would I govern the United States and what would my foreign policy be towards African na nations. It, my position is that we giving aid to African nations impoverishes them. What I want to do is invest in African nations. It's not uh, aid. It is investment. And if it's an investment, we can do twice as much, three times as much as what they currently get. The, what people are upset about is the corruption. And trust me, there's plenty of corruption here as well. But all of our aid is basically going from America's right hand to America's left hand, no matter what country we're giving it to. Uh, it, it, it rarely reaches the people. And Gaza is a great illustration of that. But so are African nations. If you look at the GDP of African nations at the year we started giving them aid, as early as in the mid 70s, early 70s. Uh, and then in the early 2000s, when they did a GDP comparison, uh, every single African nation was poorer than the year we started giving them aid. And so we must increase the investments into infrastructure uh, uh, to support uh, the African, uh, to all the African nations. But that's where I'm coming from on the sanctions. Uh, that when it's misapplied, that particular clause and that law is misapplied to commercial situations. No government in the United States gets involved when the, one company is awarded a contract over another.
And just because there's you've got some lever of power that you can use to try to win that contract, uh, that seems more corrupt to me than the other. It means somewhere, someone somewhere probably had a financial incentive and didn't get paid on the U.S. side. Thing. I think I'm on mute. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roberts. Now, let me recognize the presence of Councilor Freeman, and then I will take a question for comment from you, um, Councilor Freeman, and then after we'll move on to Mr. Nimlin. Councilor Freeman, welcome to the show. Thank you. Go right ahead, uh, Councilor Freeman. Oh, good evening, uh, Dr. Robert. Let me first of all apologize for coming in late. I'm actually in DC and I got stuck at the national um, capital. Uh, now with standing, uh, uh, Dr. Robert, um, my understanding of your approach is a hands-off approach from Africa. You have made a number of insinuations. On the first hand, you've concluded that those individuals that were sanctions, the sanction that the Meniski I was wrongly applied. It seems to me, and this is not a question. I'm not here to ask a question. I'm here to directly understand Dr. Robert's position. He made conclusory statements. You were saying, on the one hand, the sanction was wrongly applied. The U.S. government has the intelligence. Unless you are seeing you have some additional intelligence, other than the President's Intelligence Committee, uh, other than all of the national security advisors with regards to the issue of corruption. Now, let's put this in context a little bit. Take, for instance, someone came into office six years ago, and within six years, that person now becomes a millionaire. You also mentioned that aid to Africa, aid to Africa is being wrongly applied. Part of the reason that's happening because when government officials come into office, they enrich themselves to the detriment of the population. Now, that to me resembles corruption. Yes. Now, the Maniski is just one act. There is the UN Convention Against Corruption that was passed in 2003, of which Liberia is a signatory to. There is a new law that Congress just passed on October 14th, FIPA, the Federal Extortion Prevention Act. That act is a sister act to the Federal Corrupt Practices Act. However, the FCPA targets mostly businesses and non-government individuals. FIPA, on the other hand, the Federal Extortion Prevention Act, is intended to target the demand side of corruption. Leaders in other countries seeking the I mean, bribes from government officials or businesses in America these guys were not sanctioned even on a feedback. They were sanctioned on a, the Maniski Act. Now, Dr. Robert, for example, imagine yourself growing up in West Virginia, correct? And had it not been for the good schools that you were attending in West Virginia, you probably wouldn't be here today. There are a lot of young people in Africa, young children, who are unable to go to schools. Pregnant women die at child, childbirth. The infant mortality rate is so high in my part of Africa, Liberia to be specific, particularly because of corruption. Now, if those people cannot be prosecuted on the UN Convention Against Corruption, if they cannot be prosecuted by their own home country when they commit corruption because they are high power government officials, then basically what we are seeing, they should go scot free. The Maniski Act, the, the FIPA and FCPA and other Department of Justice as they have in place, I intended to target individuals who to the detriment of the population enrich themselves. The individuals you are mentioning, Minister Twe and some of the other gentlemen in Liberia, these are men who came into power six years ago. And within that six years, most of them have become millionaires. Now you're saying to me that that act was wrongly applied when the majority of the population continues to live in actual poverty. Now, I'm saying, Counselor, that you made my point for me. That's what I'm saying. You, you said it exactly. 
it, the, the, if the, the whatever corruption they did was years was was in the past. It's not over this one issue. The problem is we applied the sanctions to this one issue when maybe they are more corrupt than anybody could ever imagine. And I'm saying they it, the wrong thing was applied at the wrong time in the wrong way. If the, not that they're not corrupt or whether they are or not, that's not for me to pass the judgment. In fact, I don't want America doing passing judgment. In this case, the reason the United States got involved, uh, likely I wasn't the one to do it. So I wasn't privy to the conversations. But when I have seen this before, it we, we turn a blind eye to so much corruption around the world, and especially even in our own government. And then we selectively apply only if it's going to monetarily affect us. Okay. And so why did America not care about the corruption of these individuals for the last many years and becoming wealthy and so forth? Okay. Why? And so you make a point exactly for me of why this, I'm not saying they shouldn't have been sanctioned for something at some point uh, using the UN convention, but I am saying when it's used under what it was applied for in this circumstance, it was wrongly applied. That's why we have to be just. And the United States must start. We either need to, we need to let sovereign nations govern sovereign nations. And I, the only involvement I want to have in foreign nations is when we can invest so that we can have peace and so that we can have prosperity. We can have economic uh, em empowerment and improvement for people. You know why we started doing water, clean water initiatives in 2017 in Africa? Because I was over there doing entrepreneurship and business initiatives at the request of African governments and the United Nations. And let me tell you, I'm like, how in the world can I help them with business when they need water to, to, to survive tonight? They need food tonight. I've got to solve some basic necessities. And so the biggest problem I found was aid. It was the aid that we were sending. That's what was it. That's what's enriching your your government leaders more than anything. Uh, we've sent billions of dollars, for example, in aid to South Sudan. Uh, we've been sent billions of dollars in aid around the world, but to mostly uh, eighty five, probably eighty five percent of all the countries we give aid to are African nations. I mean, it's a, it's it's a focal point, and I'm saying that it has done nothing to help the people. And it has done everything to enrich the powers and the people in power. And that's what needs to change. That is a system problem. Uh, sanctions as a whole, uh, we have we we misapply uh, oftentimes. Look at the Russian sanctions that we did. Uh, we the, the sanctions we thought that were going to bring Russia to their knees back at the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, and Russia is a stronger economy uh, today. Uh, so w what I'm saying is you've made the point uh, beautifully for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Robert. Now let's hear from you, Mr. Nimlin, and then we'll take a question or comment from Mr. From Mr. Reese as well, and then Dr. Robert will be able to respond. But let's hear from you first, Dr. N Mr. Nimlin. Uh, Mr. Nimlin, I think you're on mute. Hold on. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much again, Derek. And uh, just before I come forward with my concern, I, I just want the counselor to, you know, understand something. Uh, I want the counselor to use the word alleged because according to him, uh, in six years, uh, Samuel Tua has become a millionaire. I don't know whether you have any evidence to that. But to my concern to the... Uh, the American businessman, politician, and the pastor, uh, Pastor, uh, you are there, and I'd like to know from you because you said uh, the finance minister favor one enterprise over another, uh, according to you, is something that uh, the United States will do a hundred times uh, today alone. So you care to tell us uh, the names of some of the companies? Are they operating in Liberia? And in furtherance to my uh, concern, sir, uh, you care to speak to uh, the issue of the sanction? Why are the sanctions being targeted by a certain group of people? In recent time, we, we've noted that six persons from 
the ruling establishment was placed on the sanction list. Why are they targeting a particular group of persons? Great questions. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Dr. Robert, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can we get the question or comment from Mr. Reeves and you can just respond to them uh, at the same time in due to time. But well, Mr. Reeves, can you come in with your question? Thank you very much. Well, we, you, you mentioned about corruption and that corruption is actually here in the United States is system, systemic. Uh, 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 for example, things that they call corruption in Liberia, one of the things that uh, most of the clients that I have uh, from immigration setting, here in, in, in the United States, uh, people who can hardly afford, uh, especially Africans or other immigrants, I can hardly uh, uh, afford to, 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 to pay for the, the green card or any document. Uh, the United States government, whenever they give the application form, uh, in fact, let me, let, me, let, me, let me be focused on Liberia instead of the United States. Many Liberians uh, in Liberia, all of us, we know that they say heaven for Liberians uh, is that of the United States. And anytime they have any opportunity to travel to, 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 to America, the, the requirement, especially the visa fee and all those stuff, and the United States government, the State Department, they know exactly how many uh, people they're going to give visa, but then they give application uh, for 50 million people. I'm just exaggerating. Give a lot of uh, applications out there, and when the people pay for 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 the for the visa or the DS or two sixty or whatever application, after they pay for it, they have a specific number that they want to bring in the United States. But they take the money from the people, and when they don't give them the visa, they don't give back the money. I mean that. Uh, that is also, I consider it to be a corruption. You are taking somebody's money and you are not giving them the, 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 the services that they need. Uh, and many of our people in, in Liberia, sometimes they will sell that piece of land just to make sure to get that visa to come to America. And then they will deliberately deny them. And America knows that they, they, they prioritize business people that will be living from Liberia to, to get a, a, a visa. What will you do different, differently uh, to, to to erase uh, uh, this kind of corruption that is going on uh, in, the, in, the, in the State Department, especially when people pay their money for visa and they deny them the visa, they don't, re they, don't re they don't give back the money. Or, and they don't tell them that we, we only have uh, 50 visa to, to, to give this year, but then the people take thousands of, of applications and then they take the thousand uh, plus, even if it is 150, you multiply 150 times thousand, they take that money and they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't refund it. And that is corruption. Uh, that is a corruption. And I, I, I want to know how you, if you are to become president, how are you going to, to do some of those stuff? Liberia is is, is a stepchild uh, to America, as we we, we believe. That's but a great the, question. The way in which they they, they treat Liberian uh, Liberians as an ally is very very wrong. If you go to to Kenya. The way in which they treat the Kenyans when you, Kenyans when you come to getting visa, they don't treat Liberia that is an ally or the country that came from the United States. So, how will you be able to 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 deal with 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 the, with the kind of situation? The American government taking tons of money from poor people and they don't they don't give back their money and then they deny them a visa. That's what I want I want to, I want to ask you. Thank Very you, Mr. Reed. Question. So let me let me answer both questions. Uh, first of all. Uh, he asked for some examples where where we do it 100 times a day. Uh, and, and I just can say a couple of examples in the United States. And I'm not saying that we do it to Liberia. It's Liberian enterprises. I'm just saying it happens in the United States alone. Uh, so, for example, Microsoft and Apple with the government always had different issues because Microsoft, 99 percent of all government computers were running Microsoft uh, and Windows uh, mm -hmm. and, and no one else had uh, even a chance. And so it was a monopoly uh, for, for de decades. Uh, and then also the most recent one, and this is within the last five years or so, uh, was between Elon Musk and SpaceX and Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin. Uh, but I've got to tell you, you know, I mean, anybody that would look at those two companies objectively, one has made numerous space uh, explorations and the other one hasn't even been really successful 
a single time near to the degree of launches. And so, uh, you know, from a, from my perspective, it makes perfect sense why uh, SpaceX got the NASA contracts and so forth. But they did the way they were favored, but they were favored for good reason. Uh, and, and Jeff Bezos, you know, one of the world's mich- richest men as well, uh, mm. owns the space company and believed that they were wrongly denied based on the contract. And so that sparked a lot of problems. So I'm saying the very issue that uh, is between the United States and this particular company, uh, we did not like how that business arrangement happened. Uh, I'm saying happens here uh, all the time. What I don't like to see is America going to a country where there is great poverty uh, and meddling. Uh, And in this case, what I believe for financial gain for someone on the U.S. side, Uh, I'm not saying whether the other officials are corrupt or not corrupt. I'm not there. I haven't seen everything they do. I'm not God. I don't know. Uh, I can tell you what we sanctioned them for in here. And by the way, if we are, I would trust the Liberian people and the Liberian government uh, and the agencies, uh, anti-corruption agencies in the world to really be able to address that. I don't believe our job is to go around and police every little thing everywhere around the world, especially in commerce, uh, because we have so many problems around. We need to get our own house clean first. So, and then to answer Mr. Reed's question on immigration. M- yeah. M- uh, Derek, I'm sorry, uh, 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 Honorable, you did not answer my, my second can we, concern. Can we get, uh, Mr. Nimlin, can we allow the guests to uh, be done? And then after right. you have a follow up, I will go, give you the opportunity. Well, go ahead. No problem, Derek. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so for Mr. Reeves' question on immigration, yeah, that 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 is wrong. That uh, we're basically playing a lottery system uh, with visas, and I can tell you, I was greatly disturbed. Even two years ago, I've been ho- I was hosting delegations from Africa, and different governors and different ministers, uh, different cabinet positions, and we had sitting governors uh, that could not even get a U.S. visa. Their visa interview was scheduled for two years from now in 2025, May of 2025 and April of 2025. These are sitting governors coming to meet with governors and Congress people and whoever else uh, in the United States to be better leaders for their homeland. And we could not even give them a visa. Yet at the same time, we have a very porous southern border where everybody imaginable is pouring through. So the whole problem of immigration in the United States is completely upside down and backwards. Uh, If the people who are trying to do it right are are uh, are being denied and then the people who are uh, doing it wrong uh, seem to be getting everything. But a lot of times in life, it sometimes looks like the people who are doing wrong are the ones winning. And I can tell you, you have to guard against letting that play tricks on your mind and kind of enticing you to start doing wrong with them. We're seeing that in the United States in the last two days. I was having to talk about all the American corruption just with the Colorado and what they're doing with keeping Donald Trump off of the ballot, which by the way, is just a symbolic move at the moment because they've made the order and then they put a stay on it. uh, And then when the US Supreme Court takes it up, it's a permanent stay, but it was enough to spark outrage. Uh, and so we have so much corruption, things that we would have sanctioned other countries for, we're actually doing ourselves here. So immigration has to be fixed. How I'm going to fix immigration is making it a 12 month process uh, to getting the green card and to getting U.S. citizenship. So we'll expedite a, in a 12 month time frame where it's a direct request with the U.S. government, no middlemen and so forth, which is where it gets so expensive, people paying fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to become a U.S. citizen, and it's taking 10 or 15 years. Uh, so it's faster right now to come in illegally. Uh, and so what I want to do is, for those who are already here, we'll have a seven-year pathway to citizenship uh, where when they're pay- as they're paying taxes and they're not in trouble with the law uh, and they don't have any criminal issues and criminal records, then they'll get to stay and they'll become U.S. citizens after seven years. We have to, but we have to plug that hole and then reward and incentivize people to come in the front door. So, uh, but we definitely need to put a stop to uh, the lottery system of a visa. If people are paying 
uh, for that process. And we already know we're only issuing certain amount, uh, then, then that's a problem. Uh, that is dishonest. But I can tell you that is systematic. That is emblematic of the thought processes that we are applying around the world. We have to stop thinking as institutions and realize that we are people. There's always people behind companies and we're dealing with people. We're de dealing with people's lives. We're dealing with people who've sold their home to be able to apply for a visa just to be denied when we knew they would be denied. See, that's that's not right. But as things are brought, injustices are brought and grievances are brought, we will do as president uh, what we're able to do to make those things right. So my Thank question, you, Robert, my Robert, question so is- uh, Your follow-up, please. Uh huh. Your follow-up. You had a follow-up, bro. Is there yeah, I, I, my, my follow-up question has to do with, uh, I wanted to know from uh, uh, the uh, Honorable, why are these, target, uh, these sanctions uh, targeted at a particular group? Because we, we've noticed uh, in recent time, six persons from the CDC were being placed on the, the sanction list. Why, why are they you know, targeting just one group of people? Well, I can't answer specifically because I'm not inside of their head. But what I can tell you, sir, is that every time I have seen the United States do this, it is because someone on this side had a financial interest, which means it is we in the act of trying to sanction someone else for being corrupt. We ourselves are being corrupt. We are mani we, we are manipulating the situation. And when they can't be manipulated, then we get upset and sanction them when we're the ones in the act of corruption. Does that make sense? Uh, so I can, while I don't, I can just as tell you what, when I've seen this before, that was always the situation. If not, we'd just stay out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, I'll come to you, that, um, Mr. Foley. Uh, Dr. Roberts, I was told that uh, we only have an hour with you, so I would just, and I need to come in too, please. I will do two more questions and then we will take a break. And then afterward, I will give you the opportunity to give us a closing remark. Let me hear from that, you. Um, and Derek, uh, uh, the question I asked uh, uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, that was not, it was not clarified. So you do, uh, you do, you do a follow-up? Yes. All right, then can you do that very briefly? Okay, I'm talking about the corruption in the American government, especially when it comes to to, 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 to immigration. They take the money from the people, they deny them the visa, and they don't refund the money. So you as the president of the United States, how are you going to address those situations uh, here in the United States and also in Africa, meaning in Liberia? How will you yes, do that? Right. You take the poor person, okay. their, their little money, you deny them the visa, you know that you're going to give of uh, 150 visa for the whole year, and you, you, your, 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 your agency is taking 500,000 applications and getting the money and denying these people, and then don't give them that money back. And most of those people, they get frustrated and some of them die from frustration. How is the Roberts government going to, to, to fix that kind of problem, especially with Liberia or any other country for that matter? Yes, Mr. Reeves, what I was stating is that I would end the lottery system. That's a lottery. I don't want people to have to gamble when they are applying for a visa to the United States. So if we have certain amount of, of visas that we're going to award, we obviously need to cut off the applications when we hit that number and then as people don't qualify or if they don't pass background checks or what have you, uh, then we are able to refund the money and open up a slot for other people to apply. Uh, but, uh, but I don't believe that people need to gamble uh, and play a lottery in order to come to the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Roberts. Uh, Mr. Foley, your question, and after we'll get, we'll come to you, Mrs. Wilson. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dr. Rowland, uh, I would just please want you to clarify um, the issue of foreign policy when it comes to Liberia American relation because as uh, majority of my fellow panelists have already said, Liberia has a unique relation with uh, the United States relative to other African nations. So if elected as president of the United States, 
how do you think you can uh how do you uh think you you will maybe build up that relation to get it back to where it was prior to the Liberian Civil War or even make Liberia to you know enjoy its status as this maybe child of the United States? Yes, well, I certainly want to have great relations with the incoming uh, government. Uh, and it, but here's, you know, over a year ago, before I even the thought even entered into my mind to run for president, uh, I was focused on and surprised at the state of education in Liberia. So the short answer is I'm going to do more investment, U.S. investment into Liberia and less U.S. aid into Liberia. That puts the money and that puts the benefit going directly to the people, not to the people in power, no matter who's in power, no matter who the regime and the government is. I want uh, to improve the lives of the people. And I was, uh, you know, because of all of the issues, uh, especially in the 80s, 90s and early 2000s, uh, with there was there was an entire generation lost of youth not being able to go to school, even uh, as recently as less than two years ago. They, they did not have one penny allocated to for the for education. Uh, and so it was the education state today is whenever churches or different private groups are getting together to try to educate the youth. Uh, people are doing what they can. But it, I think that is woefully inadequate. The best thing I can do for Liberia is to help get the infrastructure for the people and to give education for the youth. It will it will transform the nation of Liberia 20 years from now. And so that's where we have to, uh, that's where I see the investment ne uh, needing to be made. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Mistress, uh, Mistress uh, Wilson. Let me, let's hear from you. Thank you. Thank you again once more, Dr. Robert. Um, pertaining to the sanction, first of all, as you all know, I am an activist. I believe in everything should be done fairly. So the Maliski Act only apply from what I see and know. It seems as if the American government has allowed the similar thing that they are uh, uh, sanctioning this current government uh, officials for. They allow it to uh, to back to, to to go sweep up, to be swept under the carpet. Doing LA and doing previous administrations, they all did they did things. Now we all know it's innocent until proven guilty, right? So even if someone is being accused of something, and Liberia, first of all, we all know that Liberia is a sovereign nation. America has its own okay, and interfering like yourself said. Interfering into Liberia and failure is because of self interest. I personally believe prior government was working along with America to do to do all the dirty deeds, but this administration would not allow America to get away with certain things. So because of that, other people from uh, the opposition side has has. Uh, join together to do a wish hunt on this administration. If someone is guilty, let them be prosecuted. I have no problem with that. But do be fair. The the Maliski Act did not uh, uh, was not applied then. Why is this? For some reason, America is 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 hunting this government down, serving government official being sanctioned. Why? Did she just suddenly wake up one morning and say, oh, yes, this is what's going on during this time frame in the six years? And within six years, we cannot come here and assume and, and, and accuse people with no evidence. It's based on evidence. Bring your evidence. Bring your facts. Then we talk. You can assume. You can make a situation and say, because this person did this, this person, or because I believe from this time frame, this person... That's all fabricated story until proving the, in the court of law, that's the only way. I'm gonna give a quick example, you guys will wait. 
Uh, there were some kids right now in Liberia with uh, 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 the, uh, what's the name? Scott, you guys can help me. She was just found guilty, okay? But this same situation, there was a lot of accusation behind it. Other people was being accused, government officials were being accused of that incident because they did not give the justice system to do their part. But now this individual has been found guilty. These are some of the corrupted behavior we're talking about. When we talk about corruption, let us balance it here. We shouldn't be looking at one end because it's benefiting us and then we don't want to be fair. Let's be fair. If someone is wrong, let justice be served. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Robert, before you respond to that, let me just add my uh, question there real quick. I know you said on the show earlier that uh, you believe that the Maniski Act was misapplied in the, in, the, in the recent sanction. And you also talk about that you don't want to get involved with Liberia politics. Well, there is something I'm concerned with. Or there's a question I'm concerned with in your press release when you said or uh, when you asked the question, what corruption did they referring to Minister Twer? And other than on the other sanctions official, official, you say what what corruption did they commit so heinous, worthy of destroying their lives and that of their family? And I'm trying to get you to clarify this question. They said you downplaying what those government, the corrupt, uh, act those government officials got involved with in Liberia, because if I must add, or uh, some Liberia actually did celebrate the sanction of these government officials because according to them. It is the step in the right direction to end the culture of impunity in Liberia. So they think it was a great initiative of the U.S. to at least make them to, to be punished for their corrupt act in Liberia. So by you asking that question, are you downplaying that the corrupt act that they witnessed during that six years, them getting rich overnight? I just wanted you to clarify that from your press release. Yeah, no, certainly not. I, look, th that question was uh, English rhetorical in the sense of was was the fact that they favored one company over an American company, was that worth the United States ruining their lives, keeping them and their families from ever coming here and not being able to use the U.S. banking system? That so it was it was a, a form of, of English uh, that I was using to make the point. Uh, certainly not downplaying any of the corruption uh, in any other sense by anyone anywhere. Uh, but what I'm saying is, in this case, uh, when one business is favored over another business, is that worth to what degree do you, does the punishment fit uh, that particular issue? One of the questions that I've seen uh, from this panel was, uh, why did the United States target this situation and they haven't targeted all the other corruption? Uh, and the other companies uh, and, and all the other business deals. And my answer is what I have explained a couple times previously on this program is that it's if there is not a financial incentive for someone on this side, I haven't seen the U.S. ever do this. So while I couldn't say for sure that that's what happened here, I can say that that's always been uh, why they apply it so selectively in other cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Robert. Now, let's take, a, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll give you the opportunity to uh, close out on this uh, special interview again. We will talk to you after the break. Welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Wherever you're watching us from, you're here on the Liberia Radio and Television Network. We are bringing you a special interview with uh, Dr. Dr. Rollins Robert, who is a contestant for the Republican seat of the presidencies in the elections next year. So again, uh, we're here with a team of panelists and guest panelists from uh, Freedom FM. We have Mr. Foley, 
Councilor Freeman, Mr. Reeves, and Mrs. Wilson. Again, back to you, Dr. Robert. Thank you so much for your appearance here on this network. We've had a very lengthy conversation, a very interesting one too. So I, I will say thank you so much for that. But now we, with time being fast spent, I would like to give you the opportunity to give us your last word, your closing remark on this program, and then we will draw the curtain to this interview. Well, thank you, Derek. And thank you to all of the panelists. I've greatly enjoyed our conversation tonight. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, I care about everyone in the world. I will be the president of the United States and I will do right before God. I will rule righteously and uh, with sound wisdom and judgment. Uh, part of that is that I need to do right not only by our country and our citizens, but I must do right by all people in all nations on earth. And that includes the nation of Liberia. You know, most U.S. candidates aren't talking to Liberians, but there's a lot of Liberian Americans in the United States. There's 10,000 plus in Iowa alone, and that's the first caucus state here in three weeks. And so uh, I, I, my platform is that we need to focus on uh, economy, national security, and family. Uh, I believe that the strength of the nation is equal to the strength of the family, and we have to strengthen families again. By the way, that goes for every nation and every culture on earth. If you want a stronger nation, you have to have stronger families. And then Proverbs 14.34 says that righteousness exalts a nation. So if you want to strengthen your country or any other country, and what I will do to strengthen the United States is simply to start doing right. So if I have to apply sanctions on any individuals or on any nations as president of the United States, I can tell you that I will establish them and I will administer those after seeing all of the evidence, not because uh, I was felt slighted, not because I lost in a competitive bid, but because if the evidence warrants it, because I you can you can rest assured it will be because it is just. And I think that's all that the people of the world want from their respective governments is fairness uh, and equally applied law. And so America needs God. I believe uh, all nations uh, are blessed and benefited by acknowledging the uh, Jehovah God. And so uh, that's what we will do. Uh, and as a byproduct, we will be one nation under God again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rollins Robert. Again, thank you for your appearance here tonight. And we, we hope to see you again as you uh, pursue your endeavors. And we wish you well in your endeavors to be the Republican nominee for the president in 2024 elections. Again, thank you so much for appearing here. Thank you, Dr. Again, Robert. Good to see you. Again, to all of you, to all of the extinct panelists, Mr. Foley, Councilor Freeman, and Mistress Wilson, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Nimlin, thank you guys for making this interview a success. And uh, again, you guys have a pleasant, pleasant good evening. Hopefully, we can see your faces again on the Library the Network. Well, yeah, have a good night. Maintaining your vehicle can be a major investment. That's why here at Brothers Auto Care, we pride ourselves on providing professional and reliable auto care at affordable rates. Whether you need an inspection, new brakes, or diagnostic reports, our skillful and experienced mechanics are here for you every step of the way. Call Brothers Auto Care now to schedule your next auto maintenance and repair service.